Let us bow our heads just a moment for prayer. How many would like to be remembered tonight in prayer? Just for raising up their hands. Thank you. Gracious Heavenly Father, tonight we are thankful that we are standing in the shadow of thy mercy. And we pray that them divine mercies will be given to us. We are so happy that Jesus died for us when we were yet sinners, and now has brought us nigh to God by the shedding of his blood, and that we might have our sins forgiven and, and have a right to the tree of life. And tonight, as we look around in, there in the emergency room and finding those precious people yeah. so sick and right unto death, you know, to feel that divine power of God moving in like waves over the, the building. We know, Father, that you're near to give mercy to all that will call upon thee and believe. There are many sitting in here tonight, Lord, in the shadows of death. May, when this service is over, may death flee. Grant it, Lord. And may the life of God come in, give new life and new hope and new health. To those that are sick and afflicted, to those that are without God and without Christ in the world, alienated, may great light shine on their path tonight, and may they become your disciples. Forgive us of anything that we have done or said that would hinder this prayer from being answered. And may the Holy Spirit take the reins of the meeting and circumcise our hearts from unbelief unto faith in God that God might work through us tonight to will his will in our lives and for others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It is such a privilege to come and to pray for the people. Uh, many times that like I was saying in the emergency room just a few moments ago, to some mighty precious people to be prayed for. Signs does not heal. See, that was only a vindication of my, my commission to pray for sick people. A vision would never heal anyone, neither would any other sign heal anyone. But it's, it's a the vindication of a commission when he spoke to me that night, 14 years ago, 7th of May, he said, you were born to pray for sick people, and told me to love all the world. And I said to him, they would not believe me because I'm not educated, and, I, and he said, as Moses was given two signs. I would be given two signs. He said, at first, the people would put their hands on me, and then I would be able, if I not use my own mind, just, just to tell them what was wrong. He'd speak it. Then he said, if you'll be sincere, it'll come to pass that you'll know the very secret of their heart. And you already know the story and read the book. That's what I was there for. Many of my brethren have told me that was of the devil. Well, I love the Lord Jesus. I didn't want nothing of the devil. And so I was there to say until that blessing. And then when he told me about the scripture, then I knew he was right. The book was new to me. And he said, that by that they would believe. I see, that isn't because what I lack in being a preacher, having uh, education, this was given to me to pay up for that. For a man with a good, shrewd education and know he could, and know the book real well and had schooling, He'd be able to explain it in such a way. He is called to be a, a, a preacher. Like sitting here with me tonight, the preachers and evangelists and pastors, they're called for that. Well, where I lack in that, this other makes up for that. But I was to be to pray for the sick. And the prayer is what changes things. <laughs> you know prayer can change the mind of God? Did you know that? It does do it. It's, I remember one time in the Bible it did it. Do you remember? We had the most gracious little breakfast this morning I've ever eaten in all my life. What a great time we had around the fellowship of these pastors here. And Brother Hobson here made a remark that 
if I wasn't going to continue on with Abraham and I'd like to draw some some contents from that. He told us a story, which is very striking, of three men that was in a hotel or a place that they they left their the elevator broke down, they had to walk seventy flights of steps. They agreed that so far up they would uh, each one would uh, tell how that uh, some experience of life. Twenty stories, one told, fifty, sixty stories, the next one told his experience. And at the top, the fellow said, Well, the great the experience that I've had, one of the most peculiar right now. I left my key <laughs> at the desk. I just wonder if many times in our Pentecostal experiences of trying to build a big church or do something to get a lot of people in if we don't leave the key. The supernatural. <laughs> What we really stand for, Pentecost, we don't need it at the best. If it does, let's run down the steps real quick tonight and get it so we can unlock the door. So <laughs> it would make a difference how high we climb as long as we didn't have nothing to get in after we got there. That was very good, brother. I certainly appreciated that. Such a lovely fellowship that we had this morning, and I'm sure glad to know that Yakima has a fine bunch of pastors here. God, listen to them, brethren and sisters. Listen to them, they'll tell you the way of life. Now, I'm always late. I mother said I was born a little late. And always at school, I was my report card was tardy, 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 all the way down. When I got married, I was also late. <laughs> I kept for waiting about an hour and a half. And I had to make sick call first. And so if I can just be late for my funeral, I am. <laughs> It'll be all right. <laughs> I come into an evangelical United Brethren Church in New Albany, Indiana, recently, and I was just about a half hour late. And the pastor got up. And the old people said they go home at that time, and they said, "Pastor said, I now introduce you the late Mr. <laughs> well, um, reminds me of a. Brother Sweet is here somewhere tonight, Brother Sweat, brother, who was here this morning in the meeting, was over in Jamaica recently. We met with each other in Kingston when I was at the race course, and he was singing for me. And that night, the celebrity of the island had brought us out for a, a businessman's luncheon, and people were there all the way from Cuba to attend this luncheon of shoe manufacturing, team workers, and so forth. And so. One fellow said to me, he said, are you a preacher? I said, I hope so. <laughs> he said, what are you doing hanging around these Christian businessmen? I said, well, I, I, I am a businessman. Said, oh, you are a businessman, I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, what uh, do you do? I said, I'm a salesman. He said, what do you sell? I said, insurance. Assurance. Not insurance, assurance. He said, uh, what, uh, he misunderstood me. He said, what insurance is that? I said, blessed insurance. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, oh, uh, I sell that. I said, if anybody here tonight is interested in the policy, I'd like to talk it over with you. I'd sure like to tell you about it. I'm an uh, agent for the Eternal Life Insurance Company. <laughs> so I'd like to talk it over with any of you all around the hall are here. I'm sure we can, we got some agents here who keep the policy right up and going to see this, keep it going. A friend of mine, Wilmer Snyder, he's got a Baptist brother out here somewhere preaching. He's courting me up. He's here. I'd like to take your hands again, court. And Wilmer and I were very good chums in school, and he said one day he got to selling insurance. So he come up to my house and he said, Billy, I'd like to talk to you about insurance. Now, insurance is all right. but. I don't have any of that kind. We're always paying to the undertaker. Why not give something to the uptaker instead of the undertaker? So, so I, insurance is all right. I understand that. I understand that. He said, uh, Billy, I'd like to talk to you about some uh, insurance. And I said, oh, I have it, Wilmer. Oh, he said, pardon me. My brother's an insurance agent. So he said, uh, oh, I'm sorry. He said, I wasn't running around Jeff, your brother. I said, no. I said, I have insurance. And he said, uh, and my wife looked at me standing there as if I was a hypocrite. See, she looked at me and thought, well, what's this? And he said, um, what uh, company are you with? I said, the eternal life. 
And he said, uh, oh, he said, that's very good, Billy, but I'm going to tell you something. That won't put you in a graveyard out here. I said, no, but it'll get me out. I'm not interested in getting in. I said, I'm interested in getting out. <laughs> so if anybody's interested in such policy and don't have one, well, we'd like to that right, brother? Amen. We're agents here for that tonight. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm not worried about getting in the graveyard. The thing is getting out. So <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say is the way out. And Christ is that way, and I'm so glad I have the assurance. And right before us, each one of us, at the great big dark door. I know it sets before me. Every time my heart beats, I'm one beat closer to that door. It's called death. And when I come to that place, to where I know my last beat is beating, and I have to go into that place, I don't want to go screaming like a coward. I want to wrap myself in the robe of his righteousness. And go into my death knowing this, that I know him in the power of his resurrection, that when he calls, I'll come out from among the dead one day. And that's our purpose of being here, just for that. Now, we're, I'll try to finish my text tonight as Jehovah Jireh, if possible. We just got carried away last night, so in it. So, we left Abraham last night and the journey as an old man of 75 years old, that God had called him and had called a total separation. And we learned in our lesson last night that God requires a complete separation from all the world. And the scripture says, if you love the world or the things of the world, that's Abraham's seed, the love of God is not in you. So we must get to a spot in God a place in its grace until the things and pleasures of the world, I, I don't mean the physical pleasures like you go out and sit under a tree and keep cool or take a little ride in your car, but I mean the worldly pleasures, drinking, gambling, and uh, evil things. If you still love those, the love of God isn't in it. That's how we can check ourselves to see whether we've got the faith or not when the things of the world is dead and gone from us. And then Abraham, we found out, didn't obey God just right. Now, he made ready and had faith in the promise. But see, we can still have faith in the promise and then not obey, still it'll hinder us. Now, you can say, I've, um, I, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe I should, uh, I should be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, no matter how much you believe, you've got to obey that commission. Just faith alone won't work because faith without work is dead. That's right. Just like the borderline believers. Just people today, you find in the Bible it says, For it is impossible for those which were once enlightened made partakers of the Holy Ghost to fall away to renew themselves again and to repent. See if they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and count the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and done this by it to the works of grace. Now, in Hebrews 10, it also says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And those people, you've seen them come to church. They'll come and they'll say, oh, yes, I, I believe. And yes, sir, I, but they'll, they believe it, but they'll never lay their hands to it to turn one wheel to help it go on. See, now, that's just like it was in the Bible, like Caleb and Joshua come back with the evidence that they've been over in the land. But those other believers, they said, oh, it's too great, we can't do it, but... They hung along just the same. They never got to enter the promised land. Just those who come back with faith that we could. Now, what if that group would have looked? Now, they said, while well, the, the Amorites and so forth, well, we look like grasshoppers to them. Well, but to see Caleb and Joshua steal the people because they wasn't looking at the Amorites, how big they were, how big the cities were, but they was looking at a promise. God said, I'll give you the land. It's yours. Now, God gives you your healing. Each one of you, it's yours. Well, now, God just didn't go over there and take a broom and sweep out Canaan and all the Amorites and Hathites and, and all of them and sweep them out and say, come on, Israel, this is yours. We've even planted the crops for you. No, sir. They had to fight ever inch of the way. That's right. But they had the promise of victory. God told Joshua, wherever the soles of your foot tread, that I have given you. So footprints meant possession. Remember that, sister, in the wheelchair. Footprint means possession. Every time the soul of your feet sets, that's it. Take that much ground. 
say, I couldn't wiggle my finger yesterday, but I can wiggle it today. You got that much procession. Just keep moving on. Just, just keep going on. Tomorrow you can wiggle your hand. Next day your arm. Then the first thing you know, here you go. <laughs> just keep it going, you see. Footprints is procession. When you come to total obedience, then you can have procession. But until you totally obey, you've got to completely surrender your own thoughts, your own will, your own mind, and let the mind of Christ operate in you. Now, do you think Christ would, the mind of Christ in you would say, the days of miracles is past? You think the mind of Christ in you would say, the Bible is right in some places and not in other? The mind of Christ would sanction every word that Christ ever said. It's right. So if you don't use your own mind, just use his mind. That's how visions of nighttime. If I use my own mind, how, what could I do? I couldn't do nothing. But just yield myself to him. And then he uses my mind, my eye, my mouth, my all. Just yield. That's the way you do it. That's the way these ministers do when they're preaching the gospel. They get up there and take a text. Well, they just start off to preach and yield themselves to God. They're ministers. The first thing you know, the Holy Spirit, maybe take them on another text. Take them somewhere else. Someone said to me not long ago, said, Brother Branham, said, you never stay with your text. You ought to stay on the highway. I said, everybody I preach to you don't live on the highway. I have to go down the lane sometimes to pick up one down here somewhere. So I have to get off on somewhere else just before he leaves me. That's by the way it goes, isn't it, Branham? You have to... Get off the highway somewhere and go down this way and pick up one here and over here. You don't know you're saying it, but you just follow the way he says it. It's speaking to somebody up there, down here, over there, somewhere. It's for them. If you just follow his leading. Now, when finally we find when Abraham comes to total obedience and come to the place that he was everything out of the way. His father died. Lot separated himself from Abraham. Then God told Abraham, rise and walk through the land. It's all yours. Oh, I, I love that. Every time I think of that, I get a religious feeling just as soon as I do it. See, rise and walk through the land because you possess it all. Amen. That's the way we do in this Bible. As soon as we become Christians and fill with the Holy Spirit, we're seeds of Abraham and heirs of every promise. So just walk through the land. Every bit of it's yours. See what you got. See if the Holy Ghost is the same today as it was yesterday. See if everything that God promised isn't just the same. See, it's yours. Amen. When Christ died, you know what he did? He gave you a checkbook when you become his child. And at the bottom of every check, it's got Jesus' name. Now, the only thing you have to do is co-sign this check with you. Sure, you're not afraid he won't keep it. You won't keep his word. The bank of heaven won't honor it. Ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Oh, my, what a promise. Are you, could you put your name on the check with him tonight? By his stripes, I was healed. I, William Branham, was healed 1,900 years ago by his stripes. He's got his name signed in his own blood at the bottom of it. The Father will recognize that. You just try it once. Don't try it. Just do it. Anybody can try it. Take somebody who knows what they're doing to do it. That's right. It ain't a try. We don't go out trying. If you got faith, you don't try, you go do it, because you know you can. So when Abraham obeyed and he got the blessing, God said, now you've done just what I told you. Walk through the land, every bit of it belongs to you. And then we found later on, last night in our uh, course of study of Abraham, as we bring him up to what he called Jehovah Jireh, we find out in here that Abraham come to a, another place that God was going to confirm this covenant. Now, if you notice, I want to stop just for a background on where I'm going on. God always gives signs and wonders of a confirmation of his promises. Now, how many in here has received the Holy Ghost? Raise up your hand. Are born again Christian? That's a, compromi a confirmation that he's still God. Is that right? That's a compromiser. He's still a healer. How could a man ever preach divine healing without preaching, uh, preach divine grace without preaching divine healing? I don't know. What is sickness? Sickness is an attribute of sin. Before we had any uh, sickness, we had no sin. Sin come as a result of sickness. Maybe not your sin, but the sin of your parents. Just like it was given out to you when you were born. And so forth. Now... You don't have to just, if a great dragon or, or an animal 
like a lion, had his paw hooked to my side, it was a tumor or cancer, and trying to kill me. There's no need of just trying to cut his foot off for divine healing. If you just knock him in the head, it kills the whole thing. And when Jesus died for sin, he died for every attribute that sin ever produced. See? So when sin was finished, it was all finished. The complete plan of redemption. So we are, you, you just knock him in the head, but the sin question, kill sin, you kill every attribute. See? See, what is sin? Unbelief. So when you kill all unbelief, why well, you know it, God's word's right. But he's the same yesterday and forever, so all the promises are yours. Walk through the land, it's all yours. It belongs to you. Just enjoy it, it's yours. God gave it to you. The grace of God give it to you. It's all yours. When the sin question's over, you've received the Holy Ghost, everything you have need of in life's journey is right there in the Bible for you. Everything you have need of. Today, there's a woman sitting in the meeting tonight, a minister's wife who came down from Tacoma, and I had a little interview with the woman today. And sitting there, the woman had something the doctors had done, said such and such a thing to her, or something in there, which is, and she was making ready to die. And the Holy Spirit, sitting right in the room, come right around and reveal the thing. And as soon as it touched the woman, she ripped out a great big cry of joy. She was healed. God touched her body and healed her. Are you here, Sister Rasmussen? Where are you at? Are you in the building here somewhere? Sitting back there. Yes, sir. Now the Holy Spirit come into the room and reveal the thing, open it up. There was no way of, I didn't pray for her. I didn't have to pray for her. When you know the truth, the truth makes you free. Oh, I like that, don't you? The truth makes you free. When you know that Jesus died for your sins, and you've accepted him as your Savior, and you've got the Holy Ghost, and by his stripes you were healed, if you know that truth, that truth alone makes you free. Amen. No need of prayer. It's not praying. It's just believing. Believing the truth. Sometimes we have to pray to bring that truth to our heart. But God give us every instrument nearly that there is of the kingdom of God to work with to bring faith to the people. Give signs, wonders, everything to do it. But when he does it, then it's a finished work. God did it when he, when he does it to you and you believe it, accept it, then your healing is that's just all there is to it. You have to believe the word of God. Now I'm going down another lane just a minute. But recently I had a meeting in a certain city. And there was a lady come on the platform with stomach trouble. The Holy Spirit told her, said, Oh, it just happened hundreds of times in a run of a few months. It told her she had serious stomach trouble, told her who she was, where she come from. That was all true. And said, You suffered this stomach trouble for a long time. Told her what kind of an ulcerated condition it was and what the doctors had said, the type of doctors attended to her. That was all true. Then she started to leave the platform. I had to watch that. See, and then when she started, I've seen another vision. Remember, that time it's thus saith the Lord. I told her, go ye, for thus saith the Lord, you're healed. On down the line, went on through it. She went home that night. And there was one of her neighbors went and had a big lump on the side of her neck, like a fatty tumor, right beneath the chin here, or the jawbone and the collarbone here, a big tumor, about somewhat stuck out an inch or more. And the Holy Spirit said the same thing to her. Thus saith the Lord, you're healed. Well, that night going home, they were in the same car, so they discussed it. Well, they said, maybe it'll, we'll, we'll be all right. Well, the lady went home, and I told her, the Holy Spirit told her other to go ahead, that she was healed, so she went home and thought maybe she could eat. My, did it make her sick. And so then the next day, went on for two or three weeks passed, and she was no better at all. And so her husband told her, said, now, Honey, I don't mind you giving testimony, but said, just remember, said, you're no better. And said, you must, you're bringing a reproach upon the cause that, that, of you saying that. Said, you're, you're saying it's your heel when you're not. She said, look there. She said, that man never knowed me. How did he know me? And we live 150 miles before he never was. And said, he told me exactly the truth. Word by word, and you know that. And said, then, then when I started to leave the platform, he told me, Thus saith the Lord, you are healed. Said, 
If I spend another 50 years testifying it without any results, I'll still say I'm healed. Amen. <laughs> so that, that's it. That's the idea. She had it. And so a few days after that, she was one morning, she was standing washing the dishes. The children had went to school and, and her husband had went to work and she was washing the dishes at, at a window and said just like a cool feeling passed over. And somehow or other she went on, never noticed it, just maybe like a uh, shiver or something, you know, and said she just went on washing dishes and said a few moments she got real hungry. So hungry she couldn't hardly stand it. And oats always made her sick. You know what oats does to an ulcer. So she got a couple of spoonfuls of oats out of one of the children's plates and swallowed it and thought she'd go on and said, I'll know I'll vomit it maybe in a minute, which she always did, because it come right back up. And so she um, went down and eat this and she started. Never bothered her. Never burned. Well, she went back and finished up the plate. <laughs> so, first thing you know, she sang around a few minutes, nothing happened. See, her believing is over then. She didn't have to believe then, it's already done. See, you just believe on two until it's done, man, you know it. <laughs> so then, it's all the work finished. That's the way a vision is. When it says a certain thing's going to happen, then you just believe until that happens and it's over. See, you believe it's going to happen. When it's already happened, it's over. So, then after a while, she's seen, she waited about a half hour, nothing happened. She's hungry again. She fried her up a couple of eggs and got her some toast, made her a cup of coffee, and she had a gastronomical jubilee. She just had her a good time. And she waited about a, up to about 10 o'clock, and she, um, oh, just fine and dandy, getting hungry again. So she was so happy, she said, I'm going to run down and tell her neighbor. And she, when she got almost to the house, she heard somebody screaming down there at the top of her voice. And she runs the door and jerked open the door. Here was this woman with a sheet in her hand, shaking the sheet, walking up and down the floor. Said, what's the matter? The woman had the lump on her neck. She said, you know what? Said, this morning I got up and the lump's gone. I've searched all through the bed. I've shucked the sheets and everywhere. I can't find it anywhere. See? And they come about 500 miles to testify that. What was it? The angel of the Lord passed through the neighborhood that morning. See? Sometimes God can't answer just at the moment. How many knows that Daniel prayed? It was 21 days before. You remember that? Sure. But when God says anything, God stays with his word. You stay with it too. But if you leave the word, you leave God. Leave your, leave your blessing and everything there. Stay and obey God's word. What God says, God does. And that's the way Abraham had to do. So then God confirmed it with him. And we went through last night the beautiful order of confirmation. How in the Orient and how God tore Christ apart and taken his uh, body up to his right side, right hand rather, and sent down the Holy Spirit upon the church to, to anoint other sons and daughters of God. And that same spirit that was on Christ is in the church now. Do you believe that? Uh, look, I have something to say, but uh, I'm a I'm afraid it would be misunderstood. Let's take a triangle. Say like this. Now we're going to start at the bottom. That was the first Reformation, Martin Luther. Oh, it was a, it was a horrible thing to even say he's a Christian then because you were persecuted and made fun of and everything. Remember, righteous is always persecuted. Always have been and always will be. Now, that yet yeah, plenty of room, just justification by faith. That went on for a while until we had Calvin and Knox and so forth. Then after a while come in John Wesley with a new message of sanctification. The church become in the minority. Then the Wesleyan organized and they got all different kinds of organizations. Along come the Baptists and the Tamilites and so forth after that. And finally the first thing you know begin to rattle out. And now watch, it's coming closer all the time. It's like a pyramid. See? Coming closer all the time. Church becoming in the minority. Then, after the Wesleyan died out on sanctification, along come the Pentecostal with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the restoration of the gift. Now, now she's becoming in the minority. The, again, coming down. Now, it's going to, now, the Spirit of God was in the Luther, the Spirit of God was in the Wesley, and the Spirit of God was in the Pentecostal. But what is it? The Pentecostal church is an advanced Luther church. That's all. It's an advanced Luther church. Now, when it comes down to here, the church is going to have to be in such an order. If you've ever been in Egypt, you'll know that the great pyramid in Egypt that they all speak so much of, which many claim to be uh, a prophetic uh, thing that was built before the Andalusian destruction, that I could not say I 
know nothing about that. But if it was, then the headstone was never put on that pyramid. They found that they found it in different countries and so forth, but it never would come up to the diagram to fit the, the stones that was up there. It would have to make the cap there would have to be the perfect stone. If it does have any symbol of prophecy, then the headstone was rejected, just like the chief cornerstone of the Bible was rejected. But now, if we're getting closer and closer, and the Spirit of God has come from justification, sanctification, baptism, the Holy Ghost, that church will have to be so close, and the Spirit of God so perfect working in that church, that when the headstone comes, it'll cap it together, and the resurrection will come, and a whale will go to the church. Now, that, that just hearsay, see? But I, I'm trying to show you a point, that the church has got to come to a place to have the Spirit of Christ in it. The Spirit of Christ operating in our bodies, just like it operated in the body of our Lord. The works that I do shall you also, more than this shall you do, for I go to my Father. Now that was God's promise that he give a confirmation to our father Abraham, and us being dead in Christ, take on Abraham's seed and her heirs according to the promise. Then if we are Abraham's seed, the Holy Spirit lives in us, doing the works of Christ. See what I mean? Now watch, as we begin to draw near, let's take Abraham a little farther, we run into it. Just so, that We was in the 15th chapter last night, or the 16th. Now tonight, let's jump over to the 17th chapter, the first verse. When God appeared to Abraham then, after he had become ninety and nine years old, ninety-nine, in the seventeenth chapter of, of uh, Genesis. Now when he appeared to him there, he appeared to him in the name of the Almighty God. The Hebrew word there comes from the word of El Shaddai. El, strong one, Shaddai, Shad means the woman's breast, but Shaddai Shariah means the plural, breasted. He's the breasted God. Wasn't that really striking to an old man a hundred years old? As good as dead, his life stream is gone. Sarah's womb, been dead for years. She's, she's a ninety years old. He's a hundred years old. And God appears to him as El Shariah. I am the breasted God. Oh my, what? Not only breast God, but breasted God. Oh, you that don't believe in divine healing, I hope this grinds real deep. He was wounded for our transgression with his stripes for a heal. You want salvation for the soul? This breast. If you want salvation for the body? This breast. He is the El Sharia, the Almighty One, the Strong One. Not only does a woman uh, her breast is to nurse her baby. God's breast is to nurse his children. And take a little sick baby when it's real sick and fretting. The mother can take the little baby, pull it up to her bosom, and it nurses its strength from its mother. Amen. Oh, do you see it, brother? See, if we are sick, just come up to El Shaddai. Amen. Lay a hold. Nurse your strength and health from him. He's El Shaddai. Believe that, sister, that beautiful young woman in the cot. All right. Have faith in it. Believe it. Just hold on to El Shaddai, the breasted God. Not only does a baby draw its, its strength from its mother, but also it stops fretting. It's satisfied. He is a satisfied. When a baby begins to draw its, the, the strength of the mother into its own body, it's satisfied while it's a drawing. Amen. There we are. Now, if we have took a hold of God by faith and believe that he is the strength giver, by his stripes I was healed, I accept it as my possession, every promise is mine, the covenant's been confirmed by giving me the Holy Ghost and fill me with his goodness and mercy, saving me from sin, turning my head from the things of the world and setting my affections on Calvary. Now I know that's right. I passed from death into life. Something happened to me that changed my whole being. Thirty-one years that's been sweet and dear to me and better tonight than it ever was. I know that something happened to me. All right. That same one that gives me joy and strength and salvation has said, if you are sick, just come right over on this other breast and draw your strength 
for me. Oh, my. You're satisfied. It's satisfied. When I hear the word of God say, by his stripes I was healed, that satisfies me. Amen. That's right. Don't fret no more. Don't just run from here or there. Don't do this, that, that. Just, just lay there and nurse your strength and health back again from El Shaddai, the strong one. I've had many times people come. I've been in the insane institutions to watch them. So pitiful and how they are. And many times when the Satan takes a hold of those people, that four or five times their power. An insane man has many times his power. Look at, at the, uh, the maniac of Gadaria. Well, they put chains around him. He'd break them. No man could tame him. The devil had a legion in him. Now, if a legion of devils in a man can give him four or five times his strength, what will the Holy Ghost do when he gets a hold of the man? No matter if he's sick, where he's afflicted, you say, well, I just can't move. Let the Holy Ghost take a hold one time and watch what takes place. Yes, sir. Oh, it just it doubles and triples your strength. Because you're not walking in your strength, you're walking in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God raised him up from the dead and used the pains of death and giving to us as a propitiation for our sins. And we, we know that we pass the death in life and have that what we ask for. Maybe it's just one ner- a time of nursing you don't get enough strength. Just stay there. Draw from him until... You are walking until the cancer is gone. Refuse to see the cancer. Refuse to see anything that's contrary to his word. It's not so. Everything, like Jonah, they're lying vanities. I won't even see them. I won't recognize them. No, sir. I see what God said. Don't see the Amorites. Don't see the graveyard. Don't see these things. See the promise of God. God promised it. It's up to God to take care of it. Yes, sir. Now, I know that death's got to strike everyone. Death comes to us all. But sometimes, just because of unbelief, we give up and go to a premature grave. God don't want us to do that. He wants us to trust Him and believe Him and, and say it so and stay with it. Because God, Lazarus died, that's true. He rose again and He lived a normal life for many, many years because of the resurrection Jesus gave Him. And then, of course, he died again because he'll come forth in the resurrection. Jesus said he would come forth in the resurrection. But he has to go to his rest like all human beings. But until that time comes, let's not be cheated out of life for service for God because it's Satan's business to cheat you out of it. Yes, sir. But God is El Shaddai. Amen. Amen. The strong one. The breasted God. The nurse, the, the giver of strength to his sick children. When his children get sick, you say, well, I'm 90 years old. So was Abraham. He was 99 years old. But he was still just a little baby. God said, lean on my breast and nurse, Abraham. Amen. Amen. What was 99 years to God? You know what your three score and ten means to God? According to the time, he has no time. He's in eternity. But the thousand years, I think, amounts to about three or four minutes of God's time. You're put up with your whole lifetime for nearly a hundred years. So Abraham was nothing but just a little baby. And God said, get up here, Abraham. You're old. You're a hundred years old. Whiskers is hanging way down like this, the gray hair. And, and, it, and uh, you're just a, an awful old man to the world. But to me, you're just a baby. You're just a baby, Abraham. Come up here on my lap. Sit down here and go and nurse your strength back again. Oh. Everything that he gave Abraham by promise, he gave to Abraham and, and the conjunction, and his seed after him. Hey, aren't you glad you're Abraham's seed? Oh, so glad. Oh, I feel like singing that song, every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. I'm trusting in his love divine, for every promise in the book is mine. It's yours. Hey, whosoever will, let him come and drink from the fountains of the waters of life freely. It's for whosoever will can come. So God done this for Abraham, and Abraham being a hundred years old, and Sarah ninety years old. Little grandma now, like in a little shawl over his shoulder, a little dust cap on, on a little stick, We're going around like this. Well, about a few days after that, he was sitting out in the hot sun one morning, and then, oh, it must have been a terrible time. 
We're about to the 18th chapter now, and so the 19th is sitting out in the hot sun, and the herdsmen come up and said, Oh, my, they're carrying on, the water's all gone, and everything looks like it's going wrong. Watch out when that happens. To a Christian, when that happens, there's a blessing we just beyond there, and Satan's trying his best to keep it away from him. I've uh-huh. seen that in my life. When I go to pray, I get out in the woods, the green briars. You don't have them here, do you? But we have plenty of them back in the east. And they scratch you, and you get over here, and the sun shines down through the trees on you. You get over here, uh, it's on the hillside. You're praying like this, and uh, over here, there's too many rocks, and the mosquitoes is biting, and oh, everything. Now, when you get to that kind of a place, just throw up your arms and say, Hallelujah! God, you're calling me, and I'm answering to you. Something's going to happen. That's right. Because there's a blessing right there, and Satan's trying to fight you as an old mean foot foot anyhow, you know, he, he's trying his best to keep you away from that blessing. Just stay there until you pray through. I don't care what the mosquitoes bite. Whatever takes place, just stay with it. Because Satan will rob you from that if he possibly can. So here was Abraham. I see him after God appeared to him as El Shaddai. Goes back and said, Sarah, do you know what? I am just a little baby. <laughs> He said, Honest Abraham, are you? Yes, and he told me just to lean on his bosom and nurse my strength back. <laughs> That's right. He's 99 years old. Well, they're sitting out there one morning, and the first thing you know, they look to see three men coming up. And Abraham sitting under this oak in, this, in his tent door looked out, and you know, there's just something about a Christian you can tell. There's just something you know of Christian. He's ever received the Holy Spirit, talk to him a second, you'll know something's happened to him. He's passed over into Canaan's land. So you notice him, he's marked. And there they were sitting out there, and these three men come, dust all over their clothes, and said, We are strangers, we come from another land, yes, far away, glory. And he said, and Abraham got things ready and told Sarah to make some bread, as we had the other night, and brought it out and laid it before them, and they eat. Two of them went out in Sodom because Sodom is just about ready to, to be burnt up. And now one talked to Abraham, and these went out and preached to Lot, the pastor Lot, down in uh, Sodom. And he tried his best to bring the people out, but they wouldn't listen. They were just as modern as these people are today in this nation. They had their own ways and their own religions and their own cut and dried programs, and sin was heaping on every side, and they, they had their own ways, so you couldn't talk to them. You ever see people you couldn't talk to? Nobody you can, you can't speak to them because you won't believe it. They'll just listen for a second, they're gone, that's all. A little jug will fill up before a big one, you know. And so then away they go and they won't listen to it at all. Now, then there was a one that stayed back and talked to Abraham. And this one said to him, Abraham, where is Sarah, your wife? Now, if we had this seven night, I'm just going to brief it for a moment. Now, how did he know he was married, had a wife, and her name was Sarah? And Abraham said, she's in the tent behind you. He said, I am going to visit you, Abraham. I'm going to fulfill my promise. Now, who was that person? I want you to notice, who was that man that was sitting there eating? Well, he's eating veal chops, corn cake, butter and bread. Drinking milk from the cow. A man sitting there with dust on his clothes, and the Bible said that he was God. Abraham called him Elohim. Look at the big capital Lord. Lord Elohim. Trace it through and find out. Of course, the pastor sure is saying amen to it. It was. It was Elohim. And then Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Elohim, the strong one, would come down in human flesh. Oh, you get it? Elohim, the strong one, would come down in human flesh and would manifest himself by knowing the secret of the heart of the one he was talking to. Just exactly what his son did when he was here on earth. See? Dwelling in human flesh. What flesh? Your flesh. My flesh. The Holy Spirit himself. Coming down in human flesh and dwelling, showing signs that, where's Sarah, your wife? Said she's in the tent behind you. 
And he said, I'll visit you in Sarah. No woman like me have pleasure with my Lord. The Bible said they were both well stricken in age. Well stricken. Think I have pleasure with my Lord again because she is, well, she is 45 years past menopause. Think that I'll have pleasure with my Lord again, seeing I'm old and my Lord is old. She said that just couldn't be. And the angel, God in human flesh, eating meat, eating bread, drinking milk, sitting there, said, why did Sarah laugh? So Jesus said that same thing will appear just before the fire begins to fall on a modern Saturday tomorrow. See how close we are, friends? Amen. Look at the sign in the church. Let me stop here a moment. Recently I was in India where the Lord gave us the greatest meeting we ever had. To only stay two days. No place to put the people. Estimated 500,000 at the meeting. That's a half a million people. No place to put them. Outside the city limits, you couldn't get protection, and they'd have riots, and so they wouldn't let us have a meeting outside. We're supposed to this October, last of this October, to be in New Delhi, if I can get released to go, where we've got an ample theater instead of a million people, so if I have the meeting in India. And when I got there, I picked up a paper, and it said the earthquake must be over. I've got it. Clippings at home. I beg pardon. The Christian businessman used it to run in the... the their digest. So I, it said on that, the earthquake must be over. It said three days ago, two days before the earthquake come, in India they don't have fences woven wire like we have here in Washington around. They pick up rocks on the field. There's 470 people, 470 million people in India, and it looked to me like about 400 million of them are beggars. So they, they've got a lot of natural resource, but no mental powers to develop it. So they pick up rocks and make their houses, pick up rocks and make their fences, and little birds go in these rocks and build their nests. Well, and then in the evening, where there's no shade, the cattle will stand around these big tall fences for the shade when the sun's so hot. But for two days, the little birds had completely left all these little coals in there for their nests and went out into the fields in the bushes. All the cattle of the evening, they used to stand around the fence and all the sheep and everything, they get right out in the middle of the field and lean against one another, standing right in the hot sun. The people didn't know what was the matter. So look at the birds by swarms leaving the walls, going away. They won't roost there at night. They don't come back. They leave and don't return. The sheep won't even come around the fences. They stand out there against one another and the cattle. Then an earthquake come and shut those walls down. Then the birds come back. It was a sign the earthquake was over. Brother, the same God that could lead the sheep and the birds to the ark in the days of the Andalusian destruction is that same God today who can... And if God can speak to a bird to flee from danger, get away from these big walls of battle and of unbelief. There's coming a shaking time. The Holy Spirit showing signs and wonders of the destruction at hand. Look, it can happen at any time. There's not one thing left. The coming of the Lord is at hand. We see in the hangars of Russia and all the different worlds, bombs and things that would destroy the complete world in one snap. The world could not stand it. And before that takes place, the church is going to glory. Remember, before any rain ever fell, Noah was in the ark, safety. Before any fire ever fell, the angel said to Lot, Get thee hence, get out of here, because I can do nothing until you've gone hence, got away from here. Church going out before the destruction comes. And the scientific world says it's three minutes until midnight. The clock's ticked away all the time. Eternity six to set in. The world knows, the scientific world knows, that it said it would scare the people to death. You've heard that. If they put it out on radio and so forth, we know the time is at hand. And if it could happen before morning and the going of the church goes before that happens, how close is the coming of Christ? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Brother, I tell you, you can't dig deep enough to hide from one of them bombs. They'll blow a hole in the ground for 150 miles, 200 feet deep. How are you going to get out of there if you build an iron cage or a building 500 feet deep? The concussion would break every bone in your body. It's got in such a place there is no hiding place down here. You could cry to the rock. 
But I'm telling you, there is a bomb shelter that lasts. It's made out of feathers under his wings. Amen. That's the shelter, the everlasting shelter. That's the place of refuge, the place to flee to. I sat in the mountains some time ago watching little mother eagle bring her little ones from the nest. She set them out on the ground. They've been out of the old puking nest. Excuse that expression. The old nest that stinks if you ever around it. Eagle's nest. And, and then she set them out there and I was setting up herding cattle and I was, I was in these campaigns but I went up there to bring the cattle up in the springtime and I was watching through binoculars and if I ever seen a Pentecostal meeting it was them little eagles. They'd never had their feet on that grass before, you know. Nothing but the old sticky, stinky nest like the world. And the mother spread her big wings and picked them up and brought them down and set them down in Pentecostal territory. They were just jumping over one another and that good feeling on their feet. You know you know how you feel when you got the Holy Ghost? It's like they're walking on feathers or spring somewhere, just feeling good. They were having them a great big Pentecostal jubilee. And that old mother, as soon as she left them, she flew, tucked her big wings and flew up on a big high rock. Folded those big wings and sat up there and looked out. I thought, oh my. That's what he did. When he brought me out of the old nest of the world, he climbed the ramparts of glory and his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. He watches you. Let a coyote come up if he wants to. She'd pick him up so high in the air and drop him. He'd disintegrate. Yes, sir. Nothing's going to hurt her brood. She's watching it. God watches over his word. He watches over his people. He wants to find somebody that will believe him and put trust in him. I'm telling you, the glory is about watching. The first thing you know, I heard a roar. And a green from over here towards Washington, as in Colorado. I've seen a green streak coming out. I know a, a storm is coming. Thunder and lightning. That old mother sat there and she sniffed that storm a little while. And she sold them big wings and let out a great big scream. And down into the valley she went. When she went down there, she threw her big wings out, just made a big call. And every one of them little eagles run and jumped out on that mother's wing and tucked their little feet and held on to the feathers, put their little bill and caught on to it. And them great big wings begin to move. <laughs> Glory! Don't call me holy or any so we might as well get started. Yes, sir. When she tucked them big wings, she began to raise right facing that wind. And they could pierce the wind coming 60 miles an hour. And them little eagles holding on to that wing, she went right straight into the hole in the rock. I said, oh God, I threw them binoculars down and danced the whole top of that hillside. I said, someday the power of God will spread forth his great wings across the earth. And his eagles will grab a hold into the rock of ages. Lift for me, let me hide myself in thee. While the waters flow, yes sir, hold on to that rock of ages. I was up at Gary, Indiana, having a meeting. That's when this uh, little girl, Fred Sarah's dancer, was called out of the meeting. And, and Rosella Griffin, the alcoholic, and all those great things taking place just recently. They take me down to the steel mills there to, to show me around what was what are they doing. And one of the fellows, a Christian man, they had a bunch of ladies where they was running this machine shop thing, scraping off all this stuff they was making. And... So after a while, there's a little whistle blowed. And when they did, each man took off his apron, took his uh, broom, and swept all the, sh- uh, the shavings out into the middle of the floor. He said, now watch, Mr. Branham, I'll show you something. I said, yes, sir. Another little whistle blowed, every man took off. And down through the room in the aisle was laying a big pile of shavings. He went over there and pressed the door like that, or a button like that at the door, pressed it, and here come a great big magnet coming through, roaring, roar, making a noise coming through. Down to another place, down to another place, coming down. And it passed right down across all them shavings, and all them shavings jumped right up because it was magnetized to that magnet. He went right back out over a big cupola, he pulled a little thing, demagnetized that, and it all dropped off into a big cupola to be molded and made over. I said, is that the way you do it? He said, yeah. I said, hallelujah. <laughs> I said, what's the matter? I said, listen. I noticed all them shavings didn't go. Why didn't all of them go? He said, because they're aluminum. So they're not magnetized to the magnet. Oh, I said, glory. I said, why didn't that piece of iron go there? He said, you see, it's bolted down. I said, oh, God. <laughs> said, what's the matter with you? I said, I'm thinking about another great magnet. Hallelujah. The Son of God hanging under in glory. Someday there'll be a sound like a rushing wind, and here he'll come. 
and all those that are magnetized to his spirit will go up to meet him in there. Those are shackled with sin. Those are aluminum church members. will never make it. It will be molded out into the image of Jesus. Oh, my. What a day that will be. Keep my soul magnetized, Lord, with your spirit above all things. Let me take the key with me while I'm coming up this ladder. <laughs> yes, sir. For if someday he will come, the Bible says he will, and I want my soul in harmony with him. I want this contract like I tore last night. I want to be filled with this part of the contract, waiting for that to come. Amen. All with the covenant, like he confirmed with Abraham. Now, he said them things that happened. I want you, I want to give some of us old people some courage right now. I want to... You might differ a little on this, if it does. You do this just like now I do when I'm eating cherry pie. That's my favorite pie. And when I eat cherry pie, if I hit a seed, I don't eat the seed. I just throw the seed out and go on and eat the pie. So when I'm eating chicken, all preachers like chicken, when I hit the bone, I don't say, that chicken's no good and push it back. I just eat all the meat off the bone and leave the bone. So that's why you do what, you, what I'm going to say now. If you can't, just eat what meat's on it. The rest of it seems like bone or, or seed, just leave it alone. See, leave it lay there. Why don't you watch what God did to Abraham and Sarah? He showed by Abraham and Sarah, the, them two children, what he's going to do to all their children. Notice. You know what he done to Sarah and Abraham? He turned them back to a young man and woman. Sure did. Now, remember, you say, can you prove that by the Bible? Yes, sir. Now, in reading the Bible, you see, the Bible is a love story God writing to his children. you believe that? Now, I love my wife. We really got a, 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 a real love affair, she and I. So when I go overseas, uh, I, that's the reason I believe in the grace of God. I, I want, we go overseas, I, I don't come up and say, Miss Branham, tell you something. Thou shalt not have no other husband. She said, yes, and my young man, thou shalt not have any more wives either, see. Now, wouldn't that be a home? No. We get out and pray with one another. I say, God bless you, honey. I'll be praying for you, Billy. I'll, I'll see you again, sweetheart. Overseas I go. See, that's all there is to it. I'll never live untrue to her. She won't with me as long as we love one another. See, when you love God, you ain't going to hurt him. That's all. You're going to do everything you can. So that's the main thing of life is the love of God. Though I speak with tongue of men and angels and have not love, I'm nothing. See, now that's right. Remember that. A love, uh, later on in the week, ought to get you some experiences. What conquered things has been love. What conquers the sick is love. God so loved the world. God is love, and they that love are of God. Now, that's, now remember, that's not filial love. That's a gospel love. <laughs> you know, the, the godly love. Not this your free love that you call it in churches, names like that. But this is uh, gospel love. God sent love. Real, genuine love. Now, and then uh, going overseas, I wouldn't say that to my wife. Well, we just love one another. Go ahead. Now, notice in reading the, the Bible, it's a love letter to the church. Now, when I get overseas, Meaty writes me a letter. She says, Dear Billy, I'm sitting here tonight, just got the baby to sleep and so forth. She's sa saying something here, but you see, I, I can tell what she's talking about because I love her so much. I know all about her, and I can read between the lines. <laughs> I know what she's saying. Reading between the lines. Now, God wrote the Bible, a love letter to his church. Until you read the, with love, you'll never be able to a whole educational program ever find God. You've got to have the love of God in your heart. Then you read between the lines. That's where the real thing lays. I appreciate what Meaty says, but it's the love that I find between the lines that counts to me. That's the way it is with the Bible. I read between the lines what he's saying. Now, let's read between the lines just a minute. Sarah and Abraham was both old. Now, so this will get you out of your thoughts or kill that to begin with. The Bible said the very same chapter that they were both well stricken in age. He was 100 years old, 99, and she was 90. 100 years and 90 years. Now we know that a man well stricken in age, a hundred years old, stooped in his shoulders and, and um, gray hair hanging down, gray beard. Sarah, a little grandma on her cane, little dust cap, you know, going around and, and God told him that he's just a baby yet. Yeah? So I want you to notice what he done to them. Now he turned them back to a young man and woman. Here's what he done. Now if you notice, immediately after that angel appeared to him, 
See, now, that right after that angel appeared, their, their transposition, they come back to young man and woman after that. Now, when this angel of the Holy Spirit, Sarah and Abraham become a young man and woman. I can just see Sarah get up one morning and say, Abraham, dear, why the hump getting out of your shoulders? Why, Sarah, them beautiful eyes like an angel is coming back. That faded dark is in your eyes is all fading away, and that hair is coming black again. He turned them back to about 20 years old apiece. I'll show you where he did it. And you just watch me. Now they took a, a 300 mile journey. That's quite a long way for an old man 100 years old and a woman. Isn't that right? 300 mile journey down into Korea in the Philistine country. Measured on the map how far it is to see. It's a long way down there. And then the thing of it was, there was a young king down there by the name of Amalek, hunting himself a sweetheart and fell in love with Sarah. Grandma. <laughs> with all the beautiful Philistine girls that there was there, them Gentile girls. But here comes Sarah. He said, that's the one I waited on. Grandma. And Abraham said, Sarah, you're fair to look upon. <laughs> so I prayed he say you're just my sister. See? Oh, my. Don't see what he done? Well, look, even after that, Abraham, after the, even the death of Sarah 45 years later, God let him marry another woman and had seven sons beside daughters. <laughs> Amen! You see between the lines what he done? Now, let's just say another thing. Before Sarah could have that baby, excuse me, my sister, this rude expression, but I must say it. Now, we know that God had to do something. She was not fertile. We know that. Sarah was sterile. She could not have the baby because she'd lived with her all these years and she had no baby. Now, God had to make her womb first. First thing. Now, they didn't have these health and hygiene bottles in those days, so he had to give her new milk glands because at that age, those milk veins had dried up. Well, a woman of a hundred years old going into labor should have had a heart attack. He had to make her a new heart. So, see, he just didn't patch her up. He just made her a young, beautiful woman. As a promise, he's going to do to every child of Abraham. Amen. And we fell in love with her. Old grandma, a little bitty hat on top of her head, and you know, said, Oh, you're fair to look upon, dear. <laughs> you're fair to look upon. Yes. <laughs> Nonsense. He made her a beautiful young woman. Sure it is. What he's going to do to us old people one of these days. Change his back. Hallelujah! All the days of my holy time, said Job, I'll wait for my time coming. Hey, Amen! When my change will come. Yes, sir, we'll be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye and be caught up together with them resurrected ones to meet the Lord in the air and forever be with Him. Oh, I'm so glad I can say I'm one of them. Hey, I feel so religious. My, to think of that. No matter what happens here on earth, that has nothing to do with it. I'll fly away one of these mornings. Yes, sir, change it to a, And I want you to notice another thing, how God takes care of his people. Did you notice? Now, Amlick said, oh, that's just the one I've been waiting on all these years. So he went to take care of for his wife. But you remember how that pure lineage had to come to Messiah. And God plagued his house. And there was Abraham sitting out there, just kind of, he was in the promise, he had the, now just as you, you say, I'm not worthy of it. You think Abraham was worthy of it? No, sir, after a man went out there and said that about his wife, said it was his sister, and let another man take his wife to save his own skin? Sure, he wasn't worthy of it. But God don't look at your, whether you're worthy or not, it's your faith in what you promised me you will be if he'll just do something for you. There I am, like I guess a good brother said his prayers. Washed himself and stretched his big feet out to have a nice, a nice sleep. Folded his hands and said, "Tomorrow I'll marry this beautiful Hebrew woman, tuck her into the house, and, and put on all kinds of fancy clothes and earrings and fix her all up." You know, just only a hundred years old. You know, about all she was, but, but she was back to a young woman. And then the next day, when he thought he'd get married, God appeared to him in a dream and said, "You're just as good as a dead man." Yes, sir. You're as good as a dead man. Said you've tucked another man's wife. So that's a good lesson, brother. <laughs> you've tucked another man's wife. Oh, he said, Well, Lord, you know the integrity of my heart. You know that she told me that that was her brother, and he told me that's my sister. 
and the integrity of my heart. He said, that's the reason I kept you from sinning against me. But her husband is my prophet. I'll not hear your prayer, but take his wife back to him. Let him pray for you, and I'll heal you. <laughs> oh, I love that. God's grace to his children. The power of faith, the power of prayer changes things. Oh, brother, sister, we're living in the shadows of his justice, the shadows of his coming. That same God that lived in Abraham's day is just the same God today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. All oh, hell could ever break one of his promises. God stays with his promise. There's nothing that can ever change him. Oh, if we could only believe him, only realize that. Yeah, people, I'm telling you, your Pentecostal people are seeing so much and have through your life since you've become children of God, seen so much of the goodness and mercy and glory of God, so it's become too common to you. It's too common. You, you, you don't, it, that makes you lose faith. Or you just think, there's many people, maybe if you go over to Africa, down into Asia, down into Australia, some of them people have never seen it. And let some of them African natives, they see that happen, the glory of God fall like that. No, nah, they believe it. Take out a rod and break it on the ground and embrace Jesus Christ. Because well, they've never seen it before. One time there was a man. He studied. He'd never seen the sea. And he had studied about the sea. And he was going, had a vacation. He was going down to the sea. And so he met an old salt sailor, you know, coming from the sea. And he said, uh, as he went along, he said, Where goest thou, my good man? He said, Oh, I'm going to the sea. I have never seen it. He said, oh, I long to hear the wild call of the gulls as they fly in the air. I want to see the briny waves from the blue raised up and tapped. I want to smell that fresh salt water. So I've read about it, I've thought about it, but said, I'm going now to see it. The old salt pulled his pipe out of his mouth and said, I don't see nothing so good about it. He said, I was born only 60 years ago. See, he had seen so much of it. So become calm. I think that's what's the matter with Pentecostal people. You see the glory of God so much that it becomes common. Never let it become common. We must always reverence it and respect it and believe it with all of our hearts. With all of our hearts. God is good. He wants us to get the best that we have. We're his children. We, he wants us to have the best that there is. We're the cream of his crop. And he wants us to, to have the best that there is. Do you believe that? Down in Louisiana, we had an old colored brother down there, a Pentecostal brother. And he was a nice old preacher. I thought a lot of him. And uh, he kind of had my hobby of liking to hunt. And so he, uh, one day, they had an old fellow there. His name was Gabriel. But uh, they called him Gabe just for short. And old Gabe was a nice old fellow, but he, he, we couldn't get him to line up with the church. The pastor would do everything for him he could, but he just wouldn't line up with the church. Had a fine, sainted wife, good woman. She prayed constantly, and the pastor tried to get him to come to church, but he just wouldn't do it. He loved to gamble a little and so forth and drink a little. He just wouldn't line up with the church. One day, him, the pastor went hunting. And when... On the road coming home, now Gabe was oh, the poor shop there is in Louisiana. He couldn't hit a, inside of a barn with the doors closed. So they went out hunting that day, and that evening coming in, they had just loaded down with birds and rabbits and so forth, all the game. It was on Saturday afternoon. They were going hobbling along an old familiar path along the side of a hillside. And old Gabe kept looking over his shoulder, seeing the sunset. Walk on a little farther, directly down his big dark cheeks, the tears begin to roll. The pastor is going on in front with rabbits tied over sticks and hanging over his shotgun and going along like that. After a while, a great big dark hand reached across his shoulder. He looked around and said, Pastor? He turned around and said, Yes, Dave. He says, You see that sun setting on us? Yes. He said, That's setting on both of our brows. Hmm. That's setting on both of our brows. He said, you know what I'm going to do? He said, I'm coming down to the Mona's Bench in the morning. <laughs> down south. I don't know what you want the Mona's Bench is here at the office. He said, then I'm going to rise up from there. I'm going back to my precious wife and take my seat. And after I, you baptize me, I'm going to become a member of this church. 
and I'm going to remain in that church until death shall set me free. The pastor dropped his gun, threw his arms around old Gabe, and he said, Gabe, you know I'm happy to hear that. But I want to ask you something, Gabe. So what sermon did I preach that caused you to change your mind? Or what hymn did we sing in the church that caused you to change your mind? He said, Pastor, he said, I appreciate every sermon you ever preached. I always enjoy them because you tell the truth. He said, I enjoy every song that I hear the choir sing. He said, because I know it speaks to heaven and of God. But said, it wasn't that, Pastor. He said, you know, Pastor, I couldn't hit nothing. I'm a poor shot. And said, just look at the neat that God, that God has given me. He said, surely he must love me or he wouldn't be so good to me. He said, because he loves me, I love him. And from this day on, I'm his servant. Brother, that's it. If we would just look around and see how good God is to us, not our blessing, then we'd be willing to take our place at his throne. Let's bow our heads just a moment. If there's someone here who would like to say, Brother Branham, I know that God's been good to me and I haven't been good to him. I, I would like to raise my hand and say, I, I want to serve him. I, I, I want him to be my Savior. I'll raise my hand to him now. Now, I, I pray that the sincerity of your heart will be come to the spot now, this glorious anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, you may all be Christians, that I don't know. But the Holy Spirit knows. The same one that reveals the secret of the heart will speak to you now and let you know whether you are a Christian or not. If he says that you're not a Christian, will you raise your hand and say, God be merciful to me? I now want to accept Jesus as my Savior. Would you raise up your hand anywhere in the building? Anywhere? God bless you. I see that hand. Will there be another? God bless the lady here. Some up in the balcony, some are right along that way. Would you just raise up your hand? I now want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been good to me. And I haven't been good to him. I ought to give my life to him. Some of you young folks up there, it's a change here of me time of life, that reckless rock and roll age, won't you come serve the Lord Jesus and have eternal life? Let me persuade you in Christ's name to be reconciled to God. God bless this poor little one back here holding up her hand. Bow to me to my left, would you? But God bless you, sonny boy. One other, God bless you, young lady. God bless you, sister dear. Is there another? Would you like to accept Christ now as your Savior? So I want to be remembered in prayer, Brother Brown, as Christ being my Savior. Down on the bottom floor to my left, these aisles over here, someone over there, raise your hand that has them. Raise your hand if they remember me, Brother Brandon. The aisle to my right over on this side, God bless, God bless this one. Yes, God bless this little girl. God bless this lady here. That's good. Now with our heads bowed, let's pray. You that raise your hands, remember that was God spoke to you. No man can come to me except my Father draws me. That shows the presence of God is with you. Our Heavenly Father, let thy goodness and thy mercy grant it, Lord, rest upon this audience at this moment, especially upon those who raise your hands. I didn't finish my text tonight, Father. I didn't get to the subject, but I felt real strangely to stop right at this moment, talking about your goodness, how that you changed Sarah and Abraham. There may be many in here, Father, that will not be changed at that day. If that's so, Father, may they raise their hands, not only their hands, but their hearts, and accept you as personal Savior just now, that they might go on into the glory of glory to you, into the fellowship through the blood, and be reconciled unto God through the righteousness of Christ. Grant it, Lord. Hear the prayer of your servant as we commit them all to thee in the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. I just before we start and asked to come to the altar. I felt real strange about that just now. I don't believe we give out prayer. No, I think so. Tomorrow night, I forgot to tell the boys to give out prayer cards. We will give them tomorrow night for the sake to pray for the sick. I'll have them to come over to give out prayer cards. I forgot to do it this afternoon. I've been busy. I was at the breakfast this morning. I had rooms full all day, uh, discernment and things. It just made me weak, and I forgot to come to breakfast. Anyhow, is there any here that's sick and needy? Raise your hand. You have something on your heart. Just raise your hand. Say, just to God, say, Lord God, be merciful to me. I now want to accept, I want to accept my healing. I want to believe on the Lord 
There's a man sitting right over to my left, sitting way down in here. He's suffering a trouble in his neck, in his back. 
praying if you just believe, sir, with all your heart. Mr. Christensen, stand up just a minute, sir. I do not know you. Isn't that right? I've never seen you in my life or talked to you. That's right. Well, shake your hand like this. We're strangers. That's exactly what was right. That's exactly what your name is. That's all he said was true. You believe you receive what you've asked for? Go home and have what you've asked for. If that isn't the same angel, here, I'll turn my back. The angel of the Lord's in that district right now. See if it's the same angel. There's a woman sitting right behind the man. She's praying for her husband because that he won't go to church. You believe, sister, that he will go to church if you'll raise up if that's true. There she, there's her hand, see. Stand up, sister, so the people can see. Wasn't you praying, Lord God, have, about your husband? And he said, that's the desire of your heart and pray for me to call you. Raise up your hand. She's so overcome. Just at this time, she's standing there. Was those things true, what was said? If it is, that's it. All right. Do you believe? Have faith in God. Here, see if it's the same angel that met Abraham. Not me. This is just a vessel he can use. You're a vessel he can use. Have faith and believe. Let's see, I believe it's run over on that side. Let's go to this side. See if the Lord God can bring it. Now, Lord, to my eyes closed, I, I pray that you, the people will understand that it's, it's not your servant, Lord. It's the con confirmation of your word. Sinners will be called up to the altar in a minute. And let them know that the very God that talked to Abraham, that dwelt in human flesh, some kind of flesh he created, we are flesh that he created, and promised through the righteousness of his Son that we would be sanctified and given gifts, that his Spirit would move in us like it did before the destruction of Sodom. Let it be, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. There's a man sitting directly behind me. He's a middle-aged man, and he's, he's praying about a condition he's got with the cancer. And the cancer is on the, uh, the hip back part. The man is very serious. Do you believe, sir, with all your heart that God will heal you? Mr. Honeycup, do you believe with all your heart now? You'll be healed. <laughs> God bless you. It's all over now. You can go home. <laughs> you believe on the Lord? That's His goodness. God answers prayer. There's a woman sitting behind me in this direction somewhere. She's suffering with a nervous trouble. I see her. She stands before. Yes, she's been prayed for before in my life. Somewhere. She was healed, her and her son. She's suffering with a nervous trouble now. Her name is Mrs. Booth. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Have faith and be healed and God will make you well. You believe it? I was looking for that dark hair and glasses and parted on the side. I was looking through here and I couldn't find you. I seen you standing in front of me here, but I couldn't find you. Those things are true. All right. You have your healing now. The thing is gone from you. You can be well and go home and enjoy good health. Now, that's one of, I believe it's one across the building, has it somewhere? Around the building. Now, to you that raise your hand, will you come stand here just a moment? Truly, God stopped me in my message tonight and said, make that altar call. Will you come now? Stand here just a moment while we stand and sing just for a second. Come right down here. Almost persuaded now to believe. What more could God do than to do what he's doing now? Will you come here? The people here in the building are sitting out there but not knowing them at all. There's a power somewhere. And many of you people may just criticize the Pentecostal people. Come, my brother. The Pentecostal people criticize them for shouting 
and speaking in tongues. You see what that same Spirit will do? It's just coming greater and greater because the coming of the Lord is coming near. That's right. The hour is at hand. Will you rise and come here and stand down here before me so I can pray for you? If you'll hear my prayers to heal the sick and the afflicted, to let me know the secret of the heart, will you come now and stand? That's the way to do it. Come right out now. That's good. Come right down from the balcony. We'll stand right here and wait for you, friends. This is more important. Right in the midst of my message, the sort Jehovah Jireh had it on my heart to make the, the a point, and the Holy Spirit said, stop, stop, right now, stop, right now. Tell them of my goodness and call. Come right on now. Oh, The next night was healed and went home well. That's right. Remember, out of a wheelchair. Oh, to you that can walk and this young woman being wheeled down. Won't you come? Oh, first way But I didn't do it. I was ashamed because I professed to be a Christian. Brother, better to bring it right here because the whole world is going to know it one day. Let's make it right right now. Come on. Won't you come once more while I'm asking the personal workers to come with them and stand around and minister, brethren, if they will. Come around to these people here while we lead them to the throne of God in prayer. Oh, God saying in his word, 
sing in his spirit, coming down, showing signs that he's in the sun. Now. coming to the waters of separation, that they might be sprinkled from their, their unclean soul, that they might be washed in the water by the Word, and brought to renewal of life, walking into the holies now, to walk into the Shekinah glory. I pray that you will be with them and will help them forgive every sin, and as they go into the room to kneel down there for a word of prayer. I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit will fill each one with the Holy Ghost, and may they just come great glorious gushes of His Spirit. Make ministers out of these people here. Make workers and helpers in every church. Put their souls to fire, knowing that they can't stay much longer. The hour is drawing nigh when the Son of God shall come. May they find a good church home somewhere in these full gospel churches here. Be baptized unto the repentance and remission of their sins. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Grant it, Lord. Hear our prayers as we commit them to thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now the ministers here will lead you right around the corner where we meet with you just in a moment. Right this way. Every one of you. Now just right around. We'll meet with you in there just in a moment. Come right this way. Right around to the right. You're going to follow this minister right here where we to, to meet you again. Right back in here just in a minute. Yes, brother. For prayer. Yeah, for sickness. No, it's for salvation. All right. Right around this way. You. All right. That's right. Come right around, minister, brethren. Go around. Now, how many here has to receive the Holy Ghost and wants to receive the Holy Ghost? Will you come while we sing one time? How many in the building has not received the Holy Ghost? If Jesus would come tonight, you know you'll have to have the Holy Ghost. For Breathe not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed. The seal of God. People differ. People say, keep a day or do a certain thing or certain things the seal of God. That is not scriptural. Ephesians 4.30 says, Breathe not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of your redemption. How many know that? God's Word says the seal of God is the Holy Ghost. Now, and then what is the mark of the beast? is to reject the Holy Ghost, a mark of apostasy. Remember in the old days when the trumpets, the jubilee year comes, and the trumpet sounded, and every slave had a right to go free. But if he didn't choose to go free, he was taken to the temple, and they took an awl and bored a hole in his ear, and he was marked out for the rest of his days. And what is it on the ear? When God calls you to receive the Holy Ghost and you refuse it, then God marks your ear to where you'll never want to try it anymore. See? Then that's the mark of apostasy. And in the Bible said that these last days, that there'd be two classes of people, one with the mark of God, the seal of God, the other with the mark of the beast. Is that right? Now you're wearing one of those marks tonight. If it's a question, lay it up on the platform. I'll get to that subject to you. Now, if you haven't received the Holy Ghost, just join church. Would you come and stand here? 
this would be the night that many of you no doubt would receive the Holy Ghost. Fine ministers and people here, workers are all organized. This is a tea to work. And we're here to do it. And surely God has found grace in your sight. Surely. If you could just find grace in his sight. Come on now. He wants you. He wants you to come. All without the Holy Ghost. Come now while we sing almost persuaded. All right. Oh. Gentile days numbered with horrors encumbered, return, O oh, disperse to your own. The day of redemption is near. Man's hearts are failing for fear. Be filled with God's Spirit, your lamp trimmed and clear. Look up, your redemption is near. Nations are breaking, let's sing it. Israel awaiting the signs that the Bible foretold. The Gentile days numbered with horrors and comfort. Return, O oh, disperse to your own. The day of redemption is near. Man's heart, all the world, are failing for fear. Be filled with the Spirit, your lamp streamed and clear. Look up, your redemption is near. Oh, don't you want? Nations are breaking. That's right. Where's your peace talks, your big four? League of Nations? What more? Nations are breaking. Israel is awakening. She become a nation. First time in 2,500 years, the six-point star of David is flying when you see the fig tree putting forth its bud. Nations are breaking. Israel is awakening. The signs that the Bible foretold. What happened? The Gentile days numbered, old oh, brother, with horrors and cumbers. Return, O oh, disperse to your own. The day of redemption is near. Man's heart are failing for fear. Be filled with the Spirit, your lamp trimmed and clear. Look up, your redemption is near. What is it, friend? When we're going to be changed, the redemption, look at the sign. God said in the last days, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. The angel of the Lord in earth, dwelling in human flesh, amongst the people, performing the signs and wonders, everything ready, nations with atomic bombs, old peace talks and everything, as they said they would do. Israel awakening, the fig tree putting forth its buds. Oh, we're at the end, friends. And the Gentile days numbered with horrors and cumbers. You know what the Bible says about the Gentiles? Oh, my. What's going to happen to those that are cut off? So come, if you haven't got the Holy Spirit, return, O disperse, to your own. Won't you come tonight and stand for the baptism of the Holy Ghost? We're going to pray for these and lead them into the room. 
There we believe that God will fill with the Holy Ghost. Children, you precious people are standing here tonight. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Heavenly Father, we pray this prayer of faith over these people standing here that's hungry and thirsty, giving them your word, telling them that you promise they're blessed even to thirst because they want to. The word of God said they are blessed. Many people don't even want it. Then they're cursed. Those who want it are blessed, and you said they shall be filled. I'm bringing that to your remembrance tonight, Lord God. And I know you hear the cries of your people, and you're here to deliver them, and to bring them out of bondage, and to put them into the freedom of the Holy Spirit. For it's written, He the Son is made free, is free indeed. I pray, Father, that you'll give them the baptism of the Holy Ghost as they go in now to receive it. I command them to do as a trophy that you stop in me tonight in my message to make this altar call. Lord, I command them to thee to give them the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe God answers my prayer? Then go into the room, follow these ministers, some of them here. That'll lead right along this way to this room here. There you will receive the Holy Ghost. Go right in now. Nations are breaking. Israel's awakening. The signs that the Bible foretold. The Gentile days numbered with sorrows and cumbered. Return, O oh, disperse to your own. That's together. The day of redemption is near. Man's heart are failing for fear. Be filled with the Spirit. Your lamp trimmed and clear. Look up, your redemption is near. False prophets are lying. God's truth is lying. Oh God! Yes. We're at the end time, folks. We're here. We're arriving. Why did He stop me tonight? Why did he do it? I don't know. Don't think I'm beside myself. I know exactly where I am. But I'm wondering why. Is there a preacher going in there? Is there something? What's the matter? Is somebody's last call? I don't know. Strange. I don't understand it. That's right. I cannot understand it. Just as I was coming to the climax of my message, he stopped and said, This is the time. This is the time. Speak of my goodness and call. And I did it. Just exactly. The people of feel sure. Has everybody in here got the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Raise your hands. All it has is raise your hands. That's fine. God bless you. That's wonderful. All right. Is there still sick and afflicted in here while they're in the room? Raise up your hands. You want to accept your healing now. I believe you'll make every one of you well. Don't you believe it? All right. Now let's do as we do each night. Lay hands on one another. If you, if you feel... If you ever want to hear raise your hand to have the Holy Ghost, you couldn't have the Holy Ghost without being a believer. If you if you say you got the Holy Ghost and deny the power of God, you have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. See? So you're not a child of God. You have an antichrist spirit. The word of God will say every time it's the truth. God's word. Aren't you glad tonight? The God's promise. Look here. To you Pentecostal people. The Bible said, if you all speak with tongues and there be no interpreter, and one unlearned come among you, then he'll fall down. God bless you, son. He'll fall down and say to you and say, why, you're all mad. Is that right? But if there be one prophesy and reveal the secrets of the heart, then they'll say, truly, God is with you. Is that right? See what's in the church tonight? God's Spirit moving right back in, just exactly the way God said it would be. Oh, It'll be light in the evening time, won't it, folks? The light is... I'm so glad that it's the light, aren't you? We'll walk in the light, beautiful light. Come where the dewdrops of mercy are bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Let's sing it together. We'll walk in the light, this beautiful light, come where the dewdrops of mercy are bright, shine all around us by day and by night, Jesus, the light of the world, all ye saints of the light proclaim. Jesus, the light of the world, then the 
saying, well, walk in this life. It's such a beautiful life. It comes where the dewdrops of mercy are bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Now lay your hands over on one another. Come ye saints, our faith proclaimed. Jesus, the light of the world. Your commission, friends, as a believer, to lay hands on the sick. God's commission to see that they're, God's promise, rather, is to see that they recover. These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Lord God, I've tried to obey you to the letter. I'm blessing these handkerchiefs for the sick and afflicted. Your spirit is all around through the building, all over the saints, through the saints, in the saints. God with you, through you, over you, in you. God is here, his presence. We're following, walking in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another while the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Takes all doubt and fear and frustrations away from us, giving us perfect faith and confidence in God. Now, Satan, I'm calling your attention to something. I'm quoting to you the word of God, Jesus Christ, after his death, burial, and resurrection and triumph over the grave, death, and hell, over every work that you ever did or every power that you ever had, he stripped you. You're nothing but a bluff and you're being exposed night after night. You cannot hold these believers any longer. They've got their hands laying on one another. That's God's word. Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. They shall lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Come out, Satan, I adjure thee by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as you depart from this audience. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.